Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. I'm, uh, my name is Joaquin Gaga. I'm a psychiatrist and also a psychotherapist. And uh, I, um, uh, before I already uh, read something, I talk about this uh, approach open dialogue that is, uh, for me, quite important, also very controversial. And uh, also it impressed that uh, it's starting in Finland. Uh, it is Finland. It's, uh, uh, for me, one of the countries that people uh, uh, don't talk too much. It's one of the more silent uh, countries I know, and uh, it's interesting that stuff there, the open dialogue, that it's really an important uh, approach. So, just um, uh, to, to start, I also uh, would like to give my congratulations to the organization of this meeting and also to the Foundation uh, Omao de Souza, that it's really important uh, for people working in mental health and for, mainly for severe people with severe mental illness and uh, we really uh, need that kind of organizations in Portugal. So to, to start this uh, second final, uh, I'm going to uh, introduce the first speaker, Dr. João Pedro, that it's a trainee, a psychiatry trainee uh, from Hospital Santa Maria and uh, is going to talk about uh, open dialogue approach and dialogism. Uh, give me a voice and I will be dialogue. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation to, to speak in this Congress. Uh, so I'm a psychiatric resident uh, from Hospital Santa Maria, as I already said. Uh, Dr. Paulo Guvinho here on my left is the coordinator of the, of the day hospital of the psychiatric service. And Margarida Bernardo is also a resident, a psychiatric resident. And me and her, um, see you. And me and her are, um, are, we made the internship there um, at the same time. And um, in our discussions, and also with the Do Dr. Maria João Centeno as well, she is present over here. And in our, um, uh, after our, our therapeutic groups, we, in our discussions, we became intrigued with this idea of uh, open dialogue approach and the dialogism and uh, the, theoretic, the theoretical basis of it and um, we started to discuss it and uh, we became intrigued and we, we went to read something so uh, our idea for this presentation will be mainly to from the point of view of a psychiatry in, in intern from presently not from uh, philosophy or from linguistics to present and to clarify this concept of dialogism and to reflect about its possible relevance and implications contributions to the psychiatric practice so first I would like to, to say a few words about uh, this great uh, philosopher, Mikhail Bakhtin. He was a Russian philosopher as well as a literary critic, a semiotician and a scholar. And um, Bakhtin led a very difficult life because um, uh, so he, he was arrested after the publication of his first book in 29, The Problems of Dostoevsky's Heart. He was an important figure in the 20s in his country on the discussions about aesthetics and literature. But after uh, he, became he was arrested and he was in exile in the Soviet Union for more than 30 years, he only became, um, his, his, uh, his figure only became again important in the, in the Soviet Union in the 60s. Uh, after political uh, oppression in, in Soviet Union lessened a little bit in the 60s. And uh, actually the first uh, translations to Western countries only appeared in the 70s. Um, in his, in his uh, works that were mainly, he was uh, also a linguist, in his mainly examination of literary novels, he developed very important concepts, just like dialogism, but also monologism, polyphony, and chronotopes, which now I think are used, widely used and studied around the world in universities. And it is important also to say that these studies were developed together by a group of important uh, Russian scholars that now are known as the Bakhtin Circle. Here are some, uh, some books, some major books that uh, uh, Bakhtin wrote. Uh, so the first one that I, I told you about is Problems of Dostoevsky's Heart in 29, when he first developed his, con his concepts of dialogism, of polyphony. After the exile in the 60s, uh, Rebels in this World is also uh, uh, an examination of uh, Rebels' uh, novels. Uh, if, in, in, this, in this kind of, in this novel, he, he introduced the, the concept of carnival, which also is very important for, to understand Bakhtin. Tower of Philosophy of Act is more like a, um, a philosophical book on ethics and aesthetics. 
And the dialogical imagination is a collection of four essays where he introduced another important concept in, in Bakhtin, which is the chronotopes that I will talk about later. So the first thing to, uh, to say about the, the Bakhtin, I think, is that he put language as uh, the central part of human life. For him, words were conceived as material of the interior language and consciousness, as well as a privileged act of communication in, in daily life. They, he, think, he thought that words influence any ideological creation and are present in any act of understanding and interpretation. And for Bakhtin, the foundation of language is itself dialogism. This special relationship that uh, we are talking about in this Congress, that every individual establishes with the other. I, I find uh, this quote that Professor Sekula also uh, put in, in his presentation very interesting. Life is dialogically by nature. To live means to participate in a dialogue. To live means to communicate all the time. This means that everything that concerns the individual it comes from the other, from the world of, of the other. Any discourse that we make is only a link from infinite chain of previous discourses. It's, it's a point of meeting of different worldviews. Okay, meanings do not originate from the initiative moment, from the moment they are first said. They always come from a continuum of previous meanings, and the process of understanding is a reaction to the words and statements that awaken us resonances of our experience. That is the same as to say that. To understand is to like to contrapose uh, to the speaker world, to the speaker's world, like a counter world. Uh, we can trace the, I think we can trace the this dialogical principle to um, the philosophy of dialogue uh, of uh, of Martin Buber, another very important uh, philosopher of the 20th century. In very simplistic terms, of course, because his his thinking is very complex. Man is not an individual being, but is a dialogical relationship between the self and the other. And the other is the condition of the existence of the self itself, since the reality of man is the reality between the pair hi you or hi do, which sometimes is also translated in English. This means that uh, the self does not exist individually. It, 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 it is always like an opening to the other. It is very important to say that dialogue does not mean simply uh, like a communication or exchange of opinions between partners. It is, more, it, is, it is a more profound thing. It is a general principle of a collective communion of language with, never, with, with no passivity, passivity whatsoever. Uh, Bakhtin said, stated that man's individual verbal form experience takes shape and evolves under the effect of continuous and permanent interaction with statements from the other. This means that the, um, the, uh, the, the social phenomenon of interaction is, the, is, the, is the, um, the fundamental principle of language, this exchange of, of statements in the dimension of a dialogue. <clears throat> Bakhtinian subject is constituted in and, and by the dialogical interaction with others. Repu and this subject reproduces in their discourses and in their social practices the immediate social context. This means that relations of meaning in discourse um, are always comes directly from the social environment of, 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 the, of the context that we, in, in which we are. But these meanings of these discourses, it's very important to say that they are never fixed, they are never definitive. They are just constantly evolving in an incessant flow of verbal interaction which are linked to the perennial movement of history. That is to say, in other words, that we are just never the first or the source of any particular discourse that we make, but instead we are just intermediaries who dialogue with the other utterances that exist in our society. Uh, discourses are always in the dynamic movement of transformation. That is to say that the meaning of a discourse, it is, it is never resolved. The interpretation is always infinite. Now I would like, after this first segment, to uh, develop and describe briefly some concepts and elements in dialogue that may help us to understand better uh, this, uh, this, uh, this what I have said so far. An utterance uh, is the unit of speech communication, both literally and uh, metaphorically. Uh, this means that the, an utterance is the smallest uh, Units of, is, of communication, it is a continuous speech with a clear 
uh, beginning and a clear ending. And it can be, it, it is more common to be like a, a verbal ex expression, but it always can be other forms of communication, like uh, dancing, like painting, or, or, or gesturing, or, or so on. It's order to say that in its most elemental form, a utterance is something that is spoken by someone in someone else in a specific context. This means that an utterance, we cannot repeat an utterance uh, in the future. It is impermanent. It exists only in the present moment. Now, the concept of, of voices is uh, like uh, the material part or a uh, component of, of, an, of an utterance. It is the embodied quality of the utterance. The author of, uh, of, an, of an utterance is always a living person. An actual speaking is not only authoring, but is also, or it is better explained as co-authoring a distinct point of view. Every person has a repertoire of potential voices, which are shaped by his history and the dynamics of the social world. Um, voices that come from, uh, from our previous experience that we somehow, uh, that have marked, marked us somehow of our past. And um, so they can be like a voice of, of love, like we are speaking, of, uh, the voice of religion, of cultural ideology, uh, of religious, and also uh, voices, they became activated in a specific moment. And the voices can shift in, uh, in, in intensity and in primacy um, in the context of, of a discourse. But voices also refers to dimensions of expression and thought. Outer and inner speech always contains the voices of the others. And this is very important to, to understand that the voices not only um, are the explicit embodiment of the speaker, but more importantly, they are the implicit polyphonic nature of life. All thought, consciousness, and communication are potentially multi-voiced dialogical processes. Now, a very important concept that Bakhtin uh, have uh, presented is the concept of monologism, to contrast in what is uh, dialogis dialogism. Monologism refers to a single, definitive, and uniform discourse. A monologism doesn't reveal the other discourses that permeate the, the discursive practice. In Bakhtin's analysis not of novels, he considered that most of them actually are monological. Why? because they present a, this, a single voice, the one of the author. In monological works, what happens is that characters have already said ev everything. They don't have anything more to, anything more to say because um, the author is in a distanced position who says everything for his characters. So the direct power of meaning belongs exclusively to the author in monological works. So we can say, if we transport this to, to conversation, what happens is a monologue is that a monologue is a dominant speaker, which doesn't have a contributing listener. Uh, so in a monologue, there is one voice or one authoritarian voice who doesn't allow the other voices to, to, to express themselves. There is no opening no to, to, to meanings, to new understandings to form in, an, in a monologue. <laughs> this communication, a monologue, tends to be a poor communication, it tends to be static, hierarchical, and closed it doesn't produce multiple subjects or voices or lead to new jointly created meanings. Now, to contrast monologism, we have the very important concept of polyphony. Um, he, he, again, in his analysis of novels, what Bakhtin said, and he, he, he especially considered Dostoevsky a very special novelist, because in his novels, especially in his later novels, uh, they didn't provide a single vision or describe situations with a monological authoritarian voice. Uh, he considered Crime and Punishment and the Brothers Karamazov as, as being special novels exactly because of this polyphonic nature. Actually, if you, if you have read these books, they are very rich because exactly its characters um, have multiple voices inside them. E they are equal voices. Uh, Bakhtin wrote that um, these novels were characterized by, by a multiplicity, by a multiplicity of equivalent voices. Equivalent means that they are equivalent in power, in significance, and they express different points of view about the same discourse. And also that they maintain with the other voices a relationship of absolute equality as participants uh, in a large and finished dialogue. <laughs> Very interesting, this idea. Um, this means that um, 
he meant that these voices represent like a multiplicity of, of different consciousness and worldviews. And these voices are not just only the object of the, of the author's discourse, but they are also at the same time, very interesting, the subject of their own discourses. <clears throat> so that's this way that Pactin defines polyphony to refer to the existence of these, of these polarity of the independent voices and consciousness of equal value who are the subjects of their own discourse. But more importantly than, than this, polyphony also represents a theory of truth, of creativity. So for Bakhtin, um, to, for us to, to, to achieve or to uh, a, a better understanding of things and also of creation, we need exactly these uh, mutually addressed discourses, however contradictory or illogical inconsistent they, 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 they can be. In, in, in Bakhtin's words, truth cannot be held within a single mind or be expressed, as he said, by a single mouth. Now, the concept of, of chronotopes uh, could be a little bit more hard to, to explain. Uh, it refers to space and time. Um, previous to Bakhtin, space and time in narratives were regarded in, of, uh, in separate ways. We, we, we separated time and space. But uh, Bakhtin uh, said that that was not the case. For him, time and space could not be separable, separable in, in a narrative. Each narrative for, for, um, for Bakhtin had its own chronotope, which literally means time-space. And he defines chronotope as this intrinsic connectedness of temporal and spatial relationships in constructing a particular world. He characterized a chronotope as having these intersections of spatial and temporal indicators that make up a concrete wall. Now, I would like to, uh, in the last segment, to uh, speculate a little bit about the importance or relevance to psychiatry and psychotherapy of this, uh, of this concept. Uh, from more like uh, we are discussing this Congress, for a more alternative, more social constructionist point of view, psychosis is seen as um, a, this person that is make, it's trying to make sense of experiences that are so heavy for them that they have made it impossible to construct a rational spoken narrative. There are some investigators that, as well, that say that uh, uh, a person in psychosis are, is a, um, it's a way for them to try to maintain and destroy meaning at the same time. In other words, in, in our dialogical words, what we say, we can say, and it's a possibility that the person who is experiencing psychosis has not found a way to be in dialogue with itself and with the others and with the family. It, it, is, it becomes the only way for, for a person to to, to describe the situation. Now, um, if you understand the, the experience of, of this person, we need meanings are already determined in monologues, which happen frequently in our, in our psychiatric practice, I think. We, we also, have an, also have an answer for the questions that are made to us. Also family also have monologues, more often than not, of blame, of unworthiness. But if we, if we in this way, what happens, and like Professor Sekula have told us, real needs of the patient and family may never, never be discovered and will remain unsatisfied. Of course, it is true, uh, people who have experience, clinical experience, that people, they come to us for, for an answer. They come to us, they, they seek, if you want, like certainty of a monological answer to their suffering. They come to us for advice. They came to us for assurance of what is wrong. But if, if we do so in a prematurely way, what we are doing is uh, create dependence on us and also to imp the impede the emergency of a shared meaning, a reduced the capacity of the work to draw on the shared resources, um, as uh, sentences by, by, by Professor Sekula. So I think that's where dialogue comes in in, in the equation because uh, that's the, the promotion of dialogue within the social network of the, of the patient could be the primary way to reveal this individual's needs to others. Um, if you achieve to, to generate polyphonic dialogues, we, we have the merit to, uh, to provide a voice to the patient and also to everyone who is involved because everyone has a different opinion. Uh, is, the situation is perceived differently from, uh, from each person. And this uh, can be a way to open up a path for a new narrative. It is important 
that to, um, to different voices, like as Professor Sekula has just told us, import different voices, contradictory voices to, to be heard in order for the, the, the person to constitute new narratives or restitution of, of reparation. This is, I think, this is the, the, the application of the dialogical principle in psychiatry. It is, we can conclude that it, it can be a way to transform what are the monologues that are the mainstream of today's psychiatric uh, practice uh, into dialogues that encourage hope and empowerment. Because if we give a voice, I think if we give a voice to the patient, we gave them, we gave them power. And, uh, and with the voice that we gave to them and also to the family, we can construct new narratives and meanings that encourage hope. Now, I will talk about a little bit about the, the, the consequences of, of the concept of chronotopes in, uh, in, uh, in psychiatry. We can, uh, I think we can identify three different chronotopes in, 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 in practice. We have the care chronotope, which is the, the chronotope the, of the mental health services, which is always characterized by linear clock governed time, where spaces are filled with proposed activities. This, is, this, this chronotope is, uh, is, uh, is driven by the assumption that uh, a certain patient, if, if he follows a, a certain set of rules of time, of routine, a positive outcome will come. The thing is that um, if you uh, understand the patient chronotope, we think that uh, the, the, the experience of, of what happens in the, in the patient is that he experiences as time as being passing slower, circular. It is often that the patient is paralyzed and spaces and bodies that occupy them take on a wholly different set of meanings. And also, also different from the previous two, we have the, the, the family chronotope, which also has um, notions of time and space, which often we think are not the most adequate as well for, for, the, for the patient. So I think it's consensual for us that uh, the way time is structured and by whom it is determined by the dominant chronotopes in the situation. And in this case, it, it are the, do, the dominant ones are usually the care and the family chronotopes. And these chronotopes, they can be oblivious, they can forget to the value of the other time spaces, uh, for example, of the time space of the patient. So that's um, how I would like to finish my, my presentation is, to, is to, to ask, do you think we are aware of, this, uh, of these different chronotopes and uh, do you think, th is there a way for, for us to adjust to them? How can we do it? And in a more general way about my whole presentation, do you think we are promoting dialogue in, uh, in our daily practice? Uh, do you think uh, promotion of dialogue be itself a goal of treatment? We think that uh, the promotion of dialogue, as Professor Sekula also thinks, it can be a goal of treatment itself. It, it, it can be enough for the people to, to improve. And also, if we respond yes to the, to the last question, do you think dialogue should be an embodied quality of, of any psychiatrist? Do you think uh, any psychiatrist should have uh, uh, at least some, some formation in, in, in dialogue? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inspiring and interesting presentation. Uh, the, I propose that uh, we could have the questions at the end of the second presentation. And uh, now I'm going to um, introduce Dr. Valeria Bizzari. She's a professor from Pisa University. And uh, she's talking about common sense and collective internationality in a Asperger syndrome and multidisciplinary approach. So, thank you very much to the organizer. I'm uh, extremely happy to be here and have the opportunity to present my work. So, uh, the title has changed a little bit, but I will still talk about the collective intentionality and common sense. So I will start my presentation with a question. Who is the expert when it comes to understanding people, the detached scientist 
or the ordinary person in everyday life? So today I will try to answer this question. And in particular, I will attempt to understand how we can understand people who have a deficit in communication, namely Asperger and autistic subjects, whose condition is often described as a withdrawal, not just from reality, but more specifically from contact with persons. Peter Hobson describes the experience of interacting with autistic people in these terms. A person can feel that there is something missing when relating to someone who is autistic. It is as if one is in the presence of a changeling, someone from a different world. But this escapes the net of scientific methods. So autism spectrum disorder uh, was identified in the 1940s of the last century by Kanner and Asperger and raised the interest of many researchers concerning its real nature. So while on the one hand we have uh, numerous theories that conceived it as a neutrally based and merely cognitive disorder, uh, on the other hand it has also been described as an affective and behavioral deficit which <coughs> prevents the subject from being interested in the world. More specifically, Asperger syndrome or high functioning autism involves a range of symptoms usually associated with autism, which are abnormalities in the areas of social development, communicative development, and social imagination, together with marked repetitive or obsessional behavior or unusual narrow interests, but with normal development of verbal language skills and normal or high IQ. In my view, we can conceive of Asperger as a disorder of the we, that is a disorder of sociality. In fact, to be an autistic child means, with variable degrees of severity, to be incapable of establishing meaningful social communications and bonds, to establish visual contact <coughs> with the world of others, to share attention with others, to be incapable to imitate others' behavior or to understand others' intentions and emotions, while sensations experience difficulties or even the impossibility to orient on the basis of cues provided by others. Autistic subjects are also highly impaired in recognizing human faces or in displaying imitative behaviors. All of these early manifestations of autism share a common root, the skills required to establish meaningful bonds with others, which I consider under the umbrella category of collective intentionality, are missing or severely impaired. So in this talk, uh, I would like to focus on the issue of language, so I'm grateful that, uh, of, for the previous presentation, which will be helpful not only to understand what being autistic means, but also to address therapies which take into account the intersubjective dimension. So while in the first part, uh, I will introduce a poorly known account of autism, uh, that of George Frankl, in the second part, I will translate Frankl's description of autism into a philosophical language. Then, I will reflect on how this theoretical background can be helpful in the diagnostic and therapeutic phases. The history of the origins of, of the diagnosis of autism is quite fascinating. For a long time, the identification of this disorder has been linked with two names, Hans Asperger, worked in Vienna and sadly has, has been recently associated with the Nazi persecution, and Leo Kanner, a psychiatrist who worked in the same years in Maryland. <coughs> recently, two important publications, Neurotribes by Silberman and In a Different Key by Don Van and Zucker, shed new light on the genesis of autism. According to new findings, it seems that there was a third man in those years who was not only working on autism, but also met both Asperger and Kanner. This man was George Frank, a Jewish psychiatrist who worked with Asperger in Vienna, uh, but then escaped in Maryland during the Second World War, being helped by Leo Kanner, who hired him in his clinic. Frank's perspective on autism remained largely unexplored but I find it useful to support my own view on, uh, on autism and Asperger syndrome. While Asperger <coughs> focused um, on autism as a behavioral deficit and Kanner offered a neurobiological analysis of this disorder, 
Frankl offered us an analysis of autistic language. His survey being guided by the question of how does the autistic child communicate or not communicate with the people around him. According to Frankl, he sees that the state of autism has its complement in the state of being in communication with people. One is either in the one condition or in the other. Starting from the assumption that talking is different uh, from communicate, uh, it distinguishes between the affective language and the word language. The affective language concerns nonverbal communicative symbolizations such as facial expressions, uh, bodily gestures, the modulation of articulate and inarticulate sounds, and in, in his view comprises true communicative symbols which have validity in the subject's family, in her country, and to some extent even all over the world beyond the boundaries of the specific language of words that the baby is soon to learn. On the other hand, we have uh, the word language, which involves all verbal communicative symbolizations. It seems clear that our everyday language is always a fusion uh, between and an integration between word language and affective language. According to Frankl, an autistic person is a person who does not communicate his thoughts and feelings to others. The term to communicate means uh, to express feelings, affects, and emotions, and comprises more than the mere ability to utter words and to understand their symbolic meaning. It includes that set, that set of gestural and vocal non-verbal symbolizations, which uh, in its totality can be called the affective language. In other words, autistic people register a deficit in this set of symbolization, which transmits what we experience as good contact with the persons. A disturbance at the level of affective language leads to a disturbance of what Frankl calls affective contact. In low functioning autism, the priority of affective language over the word language is not so explicit because in this case we have to deal uh, with cognitive impairments as well, which sometimes prevents the subject from being able to talk, not only to communicate. The centrality of the affective language is, on the other hand, very visible in Asperger's syndrome, where not all the intersubjective communicative layers are impaired. And it's interesting to notice how a philosophical tradition, phenomenology, can offer helpful notions to describe the situation. So combining uh, phenomenological notions uh, with Frank's work, my goal, uh, is therefore to show that uh, badly pre-reflective and affective mechanisms play a crucial role in developing communicative contact with others and are those elements that are precisely disrupted in Asperger's syndrome. In order to achieve my aim, I will focus mainly on uh, the role of empathy, which in my view entails a sensory driving component that allows for an automatic understanding and experiential sharing of others' emotions, the role of specific intersubjective mechanisms, such as imitation, mimicry, emotion detection, emotional mood contagion, social emotions such as shame and guilt, joint attention, phenomena that are uh, ontogenetically viewed at play in the earliest phases of the emotional growth. An interesting element is that one of the most predictive indicators of autism in young children is precisely the impairment in joint attention, a cue which is able to trigger group identification. Furthermore, empirical studies have shown that Asperger people have problems with imitation tasks and social emotions such as shame. Concerning then the collective layers of emotions, in my view Asperger registers a loss of bodily resonance and emotional resonance, elements that are linked to one another and that can be considered as the phenomenological conceptual twin of affective language. In fact, according to Frank, affect is composed by a physical component and by an intentionally communicative symbolizing representation. So in my view, this component corresponds to intercorporeality and interaffectivity, elements that are usually mutually related in a chiasmatic relationship. Intercorporeality involves the mutual bodily synchrony that allows two subjects to experience subjective and objective qualities through their lived bodies. Interaffectivity is the very intertwinement of two cycles of embodied affectivities continuously modifying each other and each pattern's affordances. 
Usually, intercorporeality and interaffectivity allow the subject to be collectively and not only interpersonally involved in a chiasmatic, resonant and affective relationship with the other. A relationship that uh, in Asperger registered the deepest impairment as testified by studies about collective intentionality. There are a couple of forms of collective intentionality. Joint intentionality, which is distinctively goal-oriented and usually relies on explicitly formulated scores of conduct, and we intentionality, which is at stake when uh, the individual perceives herself as being part of a group and considers her mental states as contributions to that group without a specific goal. This last kind of intentionality can also be described as common sense. It's very important to notice that we intentionality does not presuppose sophisticated mind-reading capacities but lies on an immediate and pre-reflective attunement. Further, our intentionality presupposes a specific self-experience, that is, the experience of oneself as a member of a group, that is, the process of group identification. So my idea is that Asperger subjects can deal with joint intentionality, but not with we intentionality. In other words, they can talk, but not communicate since uh, the affective language interaffectivity is impaired while the word language works. In fact, I think that Asperger subjects are able to deal with a specific kind of intentionality which presupposes the correct functioning of word language, an instrumental intentionality which is purely cognitive and detached from a pre-reflective and emotional component and that enables them to succeed in group actions. In this case, the idea of the group involved uh, is an inferential, rational one and not the result of an immediate attunement with the other. Accordingly, they often register problems in establishing and maintaining relationships with others, for instance, close preemptorship, while they enjoy activities like, like action role playing games or social media. In other words, they can handle social realities which involve neatly defined roles, are highly structured, and rely on a set of explicitly formulated rules. On the contrary, they are not able to deal uh, with sociality in a pre-reflective manner. And this is also confirmed by neuroscientific studies. Schilbach noted that there is an impairment of a social interaction in high-functioning autism, which may be associated with an inability to automatically integrate socially relevant non-verbal cues when generating actions. While in a neurotypical comparison group, being looked by a virtual other generates a reduction of reaction time cost associated with generating a specially incongruent response, in high-functioning autistic subjects, the gaze of the other has no effects. According to this study, there are implicit mechanisms of interpersonal alignment called online social cognition, which are the core of the difficulties individuals with autism experience in everyday social cognition. Online social cognition, which is the ability to grasp and automatically integrate gaze cues, seems to correspond to we intentionality, while offline social cognition, that is the mere observing others and amounts to the capabilities of making a conscious effort to evaluate social information is intact. And we can link it with the process of joint intentionality. Baron Cohen describes the case of Andrew, an Asperger subject, I quote, who cannot understand or participate in the things that other people seem to do easily. Things that are so ordinary to other people, such as reading their faces, knowing what to say next in a conversation, knowing how to comfort someone. He had this sense of being a Martian ever since school days, when he could see other children playing games in the playground that didn't have clear rules. He had no idea how they knew what to do. He still talks at people rather than to them, while Andrew can do maths or memorize effects or understand the laws of chemistry or physics effortlessly. He cannot bet on the unspoken rules of human interaction." End of the quote. So to summarize, I think that Asperger patients are not able to deal with interaffectivity and accordingly we intentionality that is the affective language, while they are still able to handle with joint intentionality or the word language. Nonetheless, Frank noticed that also in low functioning autism, some understanding of the spoken language still exists. And there are compensatory strategies for the affective language. He believes that the phenomenon of echolalia, for instance, um, 
and um, this uh, vocal repetition can assume a meaning and become a sort of substitute communicative system between the autistic subject and the persons who regularly take <coughs> care of her. So this leads me to ask, uh, can we build a new affective language? And I think that phenomenology can be helpful in this direction, both in the diagnostic and therapeutic phases. So concerning the diagnostic phase, I would like to focus on a specific tool aimed at collecting qualitative data about the clinical situation, that is the phenomenological interview. A semi-structured interview informed by phenomenological concept that allow grasping the experience of a person as it, it's actually lived through by her. The benefit of the phenomenological interview is the, in the access that it gives to the subjective experience of persons involved in the clinical encounter. This is important to overcome a mere biological perspective on psychiatric illness and to have a more comprehensive view on the process of psychiatric diagnosis and treatment. In particular, uh, I intend to develop a phenomenological interview whose ideas are meant to cover all major forms of sociality. While some of those might represent concrete interpersonal relations, others can focus on shared cultural meanings and so on. In this way, I can test intersubjectivity in all of its levels, from face-to-face -face encounter to collective emotions. So the major domains uh, that the interview intends to cover are empathy, dyadic interaction, intersubjective mechanisms such as emotional uh, contagion and imitation, shared and group-based emotions. This will facilitate me to understand how the affective language works. And I also mean to involve in interview families as well in order to understand how the subject lives her affective content, and also for facilitating her closer interactions. If relatives understand how the subject engages with, with the other and the world, and they become able to attune with uh, his uh, compensatory language, the development of an alternative affective language can be more easily reached. This is why I believe that a phenomenological interview can be uh, considered also within the framework of the therapeutic phase Understanding the patient through an empathic dialogue and emphasizing the importance of therapies that take into account the we dimension can be helpful in fostering the inhabiting of social spaces for both people with Asperger and the communities they live in. And also in the attempt of elaborating a pseudo-affective language which will allow making Asperger subject to be able to communicate and not simply talk to others or at least to, to their closest people. Together with Veronica, I already emphasized the centrality of relational therapies, so I won't repeat myself. I will just depict uh, uh, two specific therapies that I consider important, both for uh, low-functioning and high-functioning autism, especially if we focus, as I did, on the issue of language and affective contact. The first one is music therapy, a joint <coughs> activity where the subjects can change and improve their self other awareness and in particular the link between proprioception and intersubjective understanding. In music performances, both of the forms of collective intentionalities are required. Joint intentionality because of course we need some representational cognitive capacities, but also we intentionality which is linked to our pre-reflective and embodied resonance with the others. It has been noticed that music therapy is efficacious for autism and is able to create some moments of a collective engagement. And another therapy which can be useful for eliciting affective contact is the DEAR model proposed by Stanley Grispan and Serena Weider in 1997 for the treatment of autistic patients. The central idea is that the treatment should be focused on development, individual difference and should be relationship based. Accordingly, the authors argue that in order to help people affected by autistic spectrum disorder, the therapist should try to develop their practical and emotional understanding of the world. And at the center of the model, there is the so-called floor time, a spontaneous interaction between the <coughs> autistic child and the adult, which is helpful for the improvement of motor and social skills. In this view, to answer our initial question, the expert in understanding people is not just the scientist, the psychiatrist, but every person who is, by definition, empathically open uh, to others and able to build the affective contact also with those subjectivities uh, uh, that 
where it seems to be lost. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, uh, João Pedro Lourenço and Valeria. I think that you introduced us to make links with other sciences, with other ideas, with, you, with new perspectives. I just want to ask uh, João Pedro, how do, uh, do you think that a young doctor, a young psychiatrist, could be trained in dialogue. I'm just, I must put my own, uh, well, I think that's a risk perhaps in substituting um, dialogue, psychotherapy by dialogue. Maybe people are not scared of dialogue, maybe, <laughs> but people are normally scared of psychotherapy as it implies that something is wrong with us. Dialogue doesn't not imply that something is wrong. Well, thank you. Oh. <clears throat> I mean, I, I really don't know, I mean, about the, the formation uh, on psychiatrists. I think at least some, some concepts would be nice. And I, because what I think is that, I mean, a, a, from in my experience, any 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 uh, uh, view on on psychosis on on psychiatric diseases is valid. The one more from a medical uh, view, the medical uh, <coughs> explanations, more psychological explanations. I think the problem is that uh, we became very early in our in our uh, work very um, you know uh, monological. We we. we it is our, uh, sometimes it is our uh, tutor uh, who is uh, in some kind of line of thought and we became like him or we, we, we read something about another psychotherapist and we became very much monological. So we, what I think is that we, I think we, we have too many certainties about what's happening with the patients and we are not open to, to dialogue even with our, it happens that we don't are in open in dialogue even with ourselves. Even psychiatrists don't dialogue too much with psychologists. Even psychiatrists, which, which are different in their comprehension of the patient, they don't dialogue with each other. So, and sometimes I think we impose the, what happens that is that we impose our certainty, our, our answers to the patients as well. And I think, <clears throat> it, I, I, don't, I don't know if, if we can, like in Portugal, to adopt a thing like in open dialogue, like, uh, like in Finland, it could be difficult, but I think in the small, um, in the small day-to-day um, basis, in the day-to-day -day basis, we can we can manage to dialogue more with our patients because sometimes I think the the failure of treatment is the lack of dialogue from us. I think sometimes the when patient doesn't come for a second for the second clinic or don't adhere to medication, it can happen that we we were too authoritarian in our in our in our indication. And we didn't dialogue with the, with the, with the patient at the first place. So I think it's it could it could be more like an attitude in itself. It can't be probably in the in the near future uh, like the open dialogue, uh, you know, like in 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 Finland in Lapland. But it's more like an attitude that we can we can have in our daily practice. Thank you for your beautiful presentations, Jean Thank Pedro. You. Thank I, you. I like it, Thank uh, you. especially at your presentation and um, I think uh, we have to promote dialogue it's it's uh, 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 no question uh, uh, not only uh, uh, in in medical settings but in the other settings too in other settings yeah um, sure so promote dialogue is a, a good thing uh, but I don't agree nothing with the other communication <laughs> Uh, the opposite view is my view. Uh, language is not the problem. The problem is another one, and it reflects on language. We must dialogue, but, but we must know what dialogue we, we are going to, to do. If a, uh, uh, a, a schizophrenic patient that have 
uh, uh, like we said, formal uh, thought disorder. Formal thought disorder is a disorder of a language. And uh, 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 things have been studied about this. Schizophrenics sometimes have gram grammatical errors. Sometimes have semantic errors. Always. Sometimes I have pragmatical errors or the understanding of pragmatical doing of language. So, when do we dialogue with a patient like that, we have to take into consideration that difficulties. It's okay. not equal to talk with the patients that have not that difficulties. And difficulties, no, uh, 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 the origin is not the language. Is other thing, the language is disturbed because was the no, thing. No, no, I get your point, origin. but uh, uh, I think you misunderstood my intention because no, no. according to, no, no, because according to me, Asperger's syndrome or, or, or autism have not problems in language, not at all. They, the problem is in interaffectivity. So with language, I meant affective language, with, which is contact with the person. I, I, I didn't mean at all uh, the pragmatist cognitive language, so you probably misunderstood my, my aim. I think uh, I just want to make a brief comment. It's not really a question that um, I think uh, many psychotherapists have the right ingredients and we already know in a way what, it, what are the right ingredients to make it therapeutic. But what I find very, very different in the open dialogue approach is um, that we take ourselves away from the expert position. We don't take decisions. We are not the ones to decide. The treatment is not our treatment. It's the patient's treatment. So, and we don't speak about patients away from them in, open, in closed doors. So there, there are some little things that uh, uh, I think are very important and I'm not sure if they are coming across enough. Uh, um, so yeah, just, just one comment. Any more questions? Good morning. I'm a family doctor. I'm a doctor, but family, not psychiatric. Um, I want to do uh, the same question to Professor uh, Jaco and uh, João Pedro. <laughs> and um, what, what is the key? What is the, uh, I feel I, I was with you one week in, in uh, Czech and with uh, a lot of uh, another professionals of uh, a lot of, of countries and what I, I feel that the key secret of the cure of the schizophrenic is the we professionals have embodiment I feel that but I will ask you then Jean Petre. embodiment it's the um, the capacity of uh, feel what the, the passion is feeling so wh when, was, uh, when they they the schizophrenics feel that we understand them they cure in the, uh, perhaps five or six section sections what do you Eu posso falar em português? Sim, sí, yes, I understood the question. Yes. Seja, o, o, que, o, que, o que eu senti naquela semana, não, sei, não sabendo nada, tenho um momento da família que tem, tem este problema, mas o que eu senti é que a base da cura é nós sentirmos no nosso corpo o que eles estão a sentir e, e eles ao sentirem que nós estamos a perceber, eles curam. Hum. Não sei se... It's, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, I, I don't, sorry. I'm not the best uh, person, but I'm a specialist or whatever. But um, I don't think that, uh, of course, we, we can't feel exactly what the other person is feeling. All right. But we have one, uh, um, we have one uh, specific uh, 
technique. I think the one technique that we, we actually have is empathy. What we describe is empathy. It's uh, uh, to, to, to try to, to be in an, another person. In a, you know, we, we, we cannot feel exactly, but we can try to feel it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's very different. It's, not, it's different from sympathy, of course. I think that, that later there will be uh, a presentation on phenomenology, and I think it will be, phenomenologists will be more more capacity to respond, but uh, empathy is, is, is also, we can train empathy. And of course, and I think, I believe very much in, in empathy that you, you have said, I think it has, it has a potential to, to itself, um, to, not to cure, but to improve, for the patient to improve. I think, uh, I think that's the case, and I, I believe that in my observations, when the, the clinics with more pain, empathy, when, when the professional has more of this capacity, and I think, it, that itself, of course, medication or uh, psychotherapy practice or or uh, occupational th therapist is it all is as its value. But if someone as um, as uh, for the first time, it's a patient for the first time, meets a, a person who is interested in doing that, um, that itself validates his suffering and that it, it itself um, improves his condition. I, I really believe that. As a, a take home message the, for me of this session, one is that we have a lot of, uh, to learn with open dialogue in Portugal. And thank you for Dr. Segura to come here. And we have really a lot because uh, uh, we need to improve our relations.